It's the weekend, and you have financial questions that need answering. That can only mean one thing. It's time for Jill on Money, the show that takes the mystery out of your finances. Here's your host, Jill Schlesinger. Welcome to Jill on Money. This is the program that takes the mystery out of your financial life. I'm Jill Schlesinger. And uh, here we are. It's the fall. I'm ready. I'm actually very disappointed in this weather recently here on the East Coast because it's like hot out all of a sudden. What happened? Indian summer. Give me my 50 degrees fall leaves. There's like no colors. It's so weird. Anyway, uh, you've got a financial question, something burning, some question that's just niggling at you. Maybe it's an IRA question. Maybe it's an investing question. Maybe it's a college question. Maybe it's a retirement question. I don't care. Give us a holler. 855-411-JILL. Send an email. Ask Jill at JillOnMoney.com. We like to begin the program with a call. And we've got Lisa on the line from Michigan. So, Lisa, I migrated you from the Better Off podcast to the radio show because I figured I was going to need more time with you. You've got a more interesting question and i'm going to have to basically do a full financial plan with you what are you doing for the next half hour (laughs) uh well right now i'm sitting in my car waiting for my dogs to get groomed nice wait what kind of dogs i have uh two yorkie shih tzu mixes they're they're the two runs of the litter so they're called um shorkies i love and then i have a pomeranian yorkie and i call her a porky Oh, very nice. All right. Three dogs. You got your. Well, this is good because I understand Mark says to me that you're retired and you sound incredibly young. So tell us a little bit about what's going on and uh, what we can do for you. Well, um, well, I'm I'm 48. I'll be 49 next month. Um, I retired in June of this year. Uh, I was a police sergeant for a local police department. And. Um, yeah, now I'm just kind of in limbo. I don't. I pretty much um, kind of got into the whole investing thing kind of later in age. Mm-hmm. But I, you know, I listened to so many podcasts and just kind of just took from each person, and I, I just saved like probably like a tremendous amount of money for over the last five years. Um, try to catch up because you know I, I started later in my thirties. Mm-hmm. Um, but I had myself in a position where. Um, I mean, I, I, I want to like, kind of look through my email where I sent you kind of all the breakdown. But I just, um, I don't know if I want to go back to work. I don't know if I could handle this with what I have with, you know, because I, I have a pension, obviously. It's not it's not the best pension in the world, but it is a pension. How much you is know, the I, pension? And have you started receiving it yet? Yeah, I just um, started receiving it in you know, July. Mm-hmm. Um, it's, the the take home after taxes is twenty nine seventy twenty nine seventy. Okay. 2970. okay. You know, pensions are guaranteed, but then they're not. You just never know what's going to happen with our government. Yeah, especially in 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 Michigan after that whole Detroit thing. Although, if you're not in Detroit, are you Detroit? No, I'm not Detroit. I'm a suburb of Detroit. Okay. Well, all right. Hope so. Hopefully, that's okay. So, twenty nine seventy a month after taxes. I know it's not a guarantee, but you know, it's uh, it's what you got. So let's go for that. Okay. So. How much money do you spend? Like, what is the expense side of this? Because I now, because we obviously, we don't, we're no Social Security yet. So what are the expenses that we're looking at? Yeah, my expenses right now, I would say, are under two grand a month. Okay. But that's just basic, you know, what, what has to be paid. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, that doesn't include, um, you know, like if Extras, I, like uh, fun? It doesn't really include fun, and it doesn't include, like, you know, something that could happen with a car breakdown mm-hmm. or, you know, mm-hmm. Christmas gifts and stuff like that. So that's oh. just my basic expenses. Okay. Yeah. And if, if I were going to add in fun, not so much like, um, like I would say, you know, if it does that include, say, like going out to dinner or going to the movies or stuff like that? Well, I, I factor in for myself, you know, about $400 for food. So I guess that includes, I, I tend to eat in, but... Um, no, I would say more entertainment's not included in there. So I can I put in like say five hundred a month for extras? Um, that would probably be a lot, but yeah, let's, let's do, that. do it. 
Let's do it. So now I've got 20. I'm going to just round it up. I'm, I got I got let's call it three grand a month coming in and I'm spending twenty five hundred. So so far, so good. That's good. What do you have in your savings, not in retirement account, but just like a boring savings account? In my savings, I probably have about twenty grand, okay. but I am doing some remodeling on my house, so that's probably going to get knocked down. To, it's probably going to be knocked down to, you know, twelve to fifteen. Okay, fine, that's all right. Um, and so you you own a house? I own a house. I have um, about fourteen years left on it. Uh huh. And um, how, what is the rate on that mortgage? It's about three percent. Wow, that's good. Yeah. What do yeah, you what do you figure the um the the outstanding balance is? It's about seventy. So. Okay. What's the place worth? Probably one forty to one fifty. Okay. The and market hasn't really hasn't really picked up around here yet. All so. right, but but it's good and you're happy there, right? For now, yeah. Oh, look at, at you least, for now. At least at least for five more years. Probably. Okay. All right. Fair enough. Um, what about? Uh, tell me about all the savings you did in the the last five years in terms of the uh, the like catch up. You know, ha- tell me what's going on in your investment world. Well, with my uh, between like a Roth, an IRA, and taxable investments, um, right now I have about four hundred and fifty thousand. That's right great. Now. That's yeah. awesome. And then I have a condo that I bought, paid cash for. It's probably worth about fifty that I rent out. Mm-hmm. Um, I am renting it to my sister right now, so I'm not like getting the high rent that I could probably get renting it to somebody else. And there's probably about a three hundred dollar cash flow right there with her there. Oh, uh, three hundred coming in or three hundred going out? Like, is it costing huh. you money to have her? No, 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 no. I'm coming in. Okay, I got gotcha. you. All right, good. Yeah, uh, down the road, you know, if I put a stranger in there, I could increase the rent. All right. Easily. This is all very good. In your pension plan, is there a carve out for Social Security? Are you one of those folks that's in, in, um, impacted by that? Uh, well, I don't get Social Security because I get a pension if I, if, as, a, as a police officer. But because I had worked, I started later in age in police work. Um, I had worked so much that if I were to go back to work, um, I think I would only have to have three quarters in order to be eligible for some Social Security. Hmm. Okay. This would be helpful, so, right? All right. Now, yeah. here's what you're going to do. You're going to hang on. I want to crunch some numbers during the break. We're going to come back, and then we're going to talk about um, what else, any other questions you have and what I think you may want to, th- what the, what I think you may want to consider as you uh, contemplate your next stages, okay? Because 48, you're really young. I know 49 next month. But um, you've done an amazing job of saving and investing and all this is, it's all very good. So nothing bad here. Um, but let's let's kind of crunch some of the numbers and then come back and we'll see whether or not um, this might influence you one way or another to do something different. You're listening to Jill on Money. And if you, like Lisa, have a big retirement question, you want to run some numbers, give us a holler, 855-411-JILL. Send us an email, ask Jill at jillonmoney.com. We'll be right back. From rookie investors to savvy veterans, Jill Schlesinger is here to help you. Call now, 855-411-JILL, or email askjill at jillonmoney.com. That's life. That's life. You're back with Jill on Money. Give us a call if you've got a financial question, 855-411-JILL. Send an email, askjill at jillonmoney.com. If you're just joining us, we are talking with Lisa. She's from Michigan. She is a retired police officer. Uh, she's really young. She's uh, going to be 49 next month. She's got a pension. She's got very reasonable expenses, good savings, uh, a house, a condo, really awesome uh, investment savings. So all of this is really all good news, Lisa. I feel I feel like I'm. I'm sort of very privileged to be able to give you like the the blessing, the the Schlesinger 
two, three, four, five star blessing. Um, I guess I have a, one other question I should be asking about your pension. Does it have a cost of living increase attached to it? No, it does not, unfortunately. Okay. Now, the reason I ask that for everyone listening is that, um, you know, if if Lisa is entitled to $3,000 a month after taxes, that's perfect now. Um, and it's great. You're, you're, you know, as you said, your expenses are probably closer to about 2500 a month. But, you know, the expense number is going to rise, but the, that 3000 is going to remain the same. So very good that you have this $450,000 nest egg socked away because I think you're going to need it. So that, you know, not this second, but as you said, you know, obviously if there's something going on, if you needed a new car or something like that, you've got a, the ability to grab it. And, um, you know, and I think that if you don't have to touch that money, even the tax, the money that's already in the taxable account, you know, the longer you can delay that, the better, obviously, because you want it to grow. Um, if you had to start tapping it right now, you would be, you know, looking to use that taxable account. And um, but, you know, I don't it, it doesn't sound horrendous one way or the other. Um, so what's what my I guess my question to you is, do you. Do you plan to ever work again? I mean, you're really young. So, I mean, it, it does. it's not like I think financially it's the most important thing in the world. But obviously, if you didn't have to spend, um, you know, ten or twelve thousand dollars a year out of your taxable account, if something big came up at the house or something came up like I need a car, that would be better. So what are your plans for next steps? Well, that kind of was the burning question is, you know, do I have to go back to work? Will my money outlast me? I don't have kids or anything like that. I mean, I don't have to leave a legacy um, or inheritance for anybody. Mm -hmm. So yeah, you know, if, if it was an option, I mean, obviously I, I might, you know, I probably would want to go back to work part time. But I don't, I'm done with the whole stress working life. And anything I do from this point is just going to be something that I enjoy doing which might not pay that much. Right. Oh, I totally get that. And and uh, I neglected to ask you, do you have a partner, a spouse? No, I do not have a spouse. Okay. Um, and so, I mean, look, I, there is nothing that would suggest from what you've told me that you have to get out there and go get a job. You know, I know uh, we at, here at CBS, we tend to have a lot of our security guards are former police officers. So, I mean, and that's like a that's a grueling job, right? I, got, I, I walk in in the morning at four o'clock in the morning. This guy is there and he's working full time. Right. So you don't have to do yeah. something like that. OK. Yeah. And I, I don't want to do something like that. So if you're telling me. Do you need to go out there and hustle? No. Would it be helpful if you could do something that you like to do? Maybe it's sort of like a hobbyish kind of thing. Maybe you're like, oh, you know what? I'm like, I love golf. I'd love to go just like work at the at the, this golf club and get like, you know, I don't know, reduced greens fees or something. I don't know. Um, but or I want to work in a bookstore because I love books. And you're just going to make 10 or 12 bucks an hour. Yeah. That that would be helpful. I mean, again, because you're so young, um, number one, you, we want you to use your brain. Number two, I'd love it if you didn't have to dip into the taxable account. But there is nothing urgent about that, Lisa. I don't want you to feel that stress or strain in any way, shape, or form because you've you've already done it. You've done you've done the hard work. Yeah. Yeah, I guess it was. Just, it's just that fear: is this going to be enough, or you know, am I going to have to go back to work? You know, this, 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 it keeps me up at night. You know? Well, I don't want you to be kept up at night. Come on, now, wait a second. I, I mean, well, you I, know, I there's you've got okay. There's a happy medium here. You know, four hundred fifty grand is a lot of money that you've saved, and you've got this three grand a month coming in. So that's like your basics. If I had to turn the spigot of your money of you know your your 450 grand on right now if i just had to say like okay how much money you could pull probably a thousand dollars a month out of that account every single month for the rest of your life i mean again you're not 59 and a half yet but yeah you know if you could do that easily and not worry about running out of money okay okay so yeah. that but, you know, if you could say, hey, instead of doing that, I'm going to make a thousand dollars a month doing something fun. That's even better because then you're not invading the money that you have set aside. OK, so no pressure, but do something anyway. You're smart. You're vibrant. Go, you know, do something that you're going to like. It's going to make you feel good about waking up in the morning and 
do something that maybe will prevent you from dipping into the corpus of all the nice savings that you've done. How's that? Sounds great. I do have one other question, if you have a minute. Sure. So um, when I did um, when I did retire, um, there was the four, uh, 453 or 457 that I had to roll over, mm-hmm. and I rolled it over into Vanguard, which I had sat down and got a plan set in place. But some, for some reason, the money got rolled into a money market account, mm-hmm. and I had no idea it's been sitting in a money market account for a couple months, which, right. you know, about, we've had all these gains. Um, at this stage in the game, what do I do? Do I keep it there and wait for the market to take a, a correction? Mm-hmm. Well, I'll tell you what. As soon as you invest, let me know because I'm sure the market will go straight down after that <laughs> because that's what happens when these events occur. Yeah, I mean, a lot of people don't realize that when you do a tape-to-tape transfer, when you have a plan that goes into a new r- rollover IRA, it usually does come in in cash. That said... Um, You know, you're investing for a long time, hopefully 30, 35 years, right? And so I would, if you're really incredibly nervous and uptight about putting all the money to work at once, then I would dollar cost average. Pick your funds, say, you know, I want to get, how much, how much was in the rollover account? What's the total? Uh, Like 245. So maybe you say that, you know, 20 grand a month, if you want to get it going until you're fully invested, that's fine. I would just okay. invest it and not look back, but just laugh to yourself because when you invest it, that will be the beginning of the next bear market. You'll exactly. survive, I promise. But if you're if you're okay. if you're uptight about it, then dollar cost average, um, dollar cost averaging is better if the market goes down very quickly. It's worse if the market keeps going up. So it, it okay. depends kind of like where you're emotionally. St- where you stand, because if you're more worried about losing on the way down, do go- dollar cost averaging. If you are more worried about missing more upside, then get the money to work. Get the money. Okay. All well, right. thank you. I hope, I hope now I can sleep at night. It's I want you to happen. sleep at night. Uh, you know, th- this is, you have done a great job. And that's the thing, Lisa. I mean, to hear that you're not sleeping at night makes me so upset because I'm like, oh my God, she's in great shape. So you're in great shape. You've done the hard work. You got your that that's I mean, but you could see, by the way, had you not done that work in the last five years, that supplemental retirement, that's like the key that gives you all the opportunity in the world. Definitely. Definitely. And I just I think it's just hard just going from having this solid, secure, good income. to like, you know, making a third of what you made. It's like a nickel and dime everything now. And I don't want to live like that. No, don't live like that. You work too hard. You've done all the work. Get get yourself together. Relax a little bit here. You can take it. You know, you've taken the summer off. That's good. Figure out what right. your next steps are and go have some fun and get me that thousand bucks a month. All right. <laughs> all right. I'll start looking for some jobs. Thank all you right. So much. I appreciate it. I love your podcast. Well, thank you. thank you so much and have fun with those puppies. Thanks for calling, Lisa. I I uh, another half. I, I hate when people lose sleep. It bums me out because I feel like, oh, my gosh, the, she's in such good shape. She really is. Mark, how did you not get involved? You were worked in radio when there were pensions. How did you not have a pension? You just missed it? Oh, yeah. He says that a lot of the people who have those pensions stick around. They're not very happy. It's true. Some of them just walked by. Uh, all right. You're listening to Jill on Money, 855-411-JILL. Send us an email. Ask Jill at JillOnMoney.com. We'll be right back. Flat on my face. You're back with Jill on Money. If you've got a financial question, we'd love to hear from you. 855-411-JILL. Send an email at askjill at jillonmoney.com. Got some questions about um, the FAFSA form, which is available as of October 1st. And uh, Steve wanted to know about what can a high school student in ninth grade do this year over the next few years to prepare themselves for being a good candidate for receiving scholarships and grants? Well, number one 
is that you can be a good student because that is always a good way to try to get money, you know, academic scholarships. But number two is having real conversations about what your family can afford. I think that that may be a bit of the missing piece here for a lot of families that, you know, you have the conversations too late in the in the um, time horizon that you say, oh, my God, I'm going to tell my kid after we've already gone and visited colleges that actually we can't really afford this. And so I think that if you are a a family where you're making, you know, up to eh, it's not only your income, but let's just say about a couple hundred thousand dollars a year, chances are you can get some aid. Some of it is just preparing the FAFSA. Some of it is putting yourself in a place where you can try to receive some scholarships or grants. But having conversations about what we can afford as a family is really important. And Equally important, Dad, is that uh, you you don't raid your own retirement to pay for your kid's college education. Um, so that's what I would do. Conversations, work hard, all that fun stuff. Um, so this other this other question is um, that that Steve went to Next Gen Vest because remember we had Kelly Peeler on, who is the CEO of Next Gen Vest, and says there's a link for signing up free for Next Gen Vest, but how do they keep the lights on? I think that um, Mark and I were just talking. I think that what they do is they um, sell stuff to schools, like curriculum stuff. Mark, is that what it is, or is it data? I don't know what they do, but anyway, they are that they they get it through the schools. Um, someone else wanted to know about unfreezing credit for FAFSA. Um, well, you may be it, it, it. You may not need to, but what's most important is that uh, you. It, because if you're going for any other kind of loans, then you probably are going to need to unfreeze credit. So that's something to keep in mind. You know, again, as Kelly said, $2.7 billion, with a B, billion dollars a year is going unclaimed. And the biggest reason is that people just say, say I'm not going to get it. And yet you may. So So go ahead and do it. We keep saying to the folks who are coming on the air and who are asking these questions, you know, why is it that you're waiting to consider these questions so late? And why are you grad- letting your kids graduate with all this money in debt? It's really going to rob them of opportunity. And it's hard to say that after the fact. So for those of you listening who have younger kids, get it done now. Get it done now, meaning talk to your kids, be clear. And, you know, if you can save, that's great. But it's much more important to to your financial future that you are putting money away for your retirement rather than your kids. That education, you can go to a cheaper school. You can hustle to get, you know, your student loans, your grants. You can take loans if need be. But... There's nothing that you as parents can do to make your retirement secure except save for your retirement. That is why we pounce on that. That is why the the consistent message really has to be that you are taking care of yourself. I mean, there's nothing else you can do. You've got to take care of yourself. Kids are going to be okay. And get those FAFSA forms done quickly because, as Kelly liked to remind us, there's a lot of money that is predicated on a limited pool. And if you're not filling out that FAFSA form, uh, your school, your state, they may not, they may run out of money. So go out and get it. It's just, uh, it's hard. We know we we know you need a college education. We don't know that you need such an expensive college education. You know, there there's nothing that is more important than getting, you know, to survive in this economy is a degree. But that's not to say that you have to have a degree where you are paying a gazillion dollars for the rest of your life. And if you want to be successful or find your way in this economy, 
you're going to have to actually work this. You're going to have to work it. You're going to have to be able to go to college. And again, if you have a chance to go to a big name school, chances are they've got a big endowment. You're going to go for free. But to go to some um, private school where it's not even like a big name brand, but you're going to graduate in tons of debt, that's crazy. You know? And yeah, I mean, I get it. Some of those brand name schools, they open doors. They open um, potential hiring opportunities, maybe graduate programs. But, you know, at the at the very at the very tip top, yeah, that's true. But I don't think that that's something that is talked about. That there are certain schools that really are not really worth going into debt for, and we have to be a little bit more blunt about that. You know, cost of college has skyrocketed much more so than the rate of inflation. And I, I I know that it's terrible to consider that, but it is really important to try to be clear-eyed about this part of it. Get your college degree. You can go to a name brand school. Great. If you can't, find a cheaper way to get the degree. It's Jill on Money, 855-411-JILL. Send an email, ask Jill at jillonmoney.com. We'll be right back. IRAs, refinancing. She covers it all. Back to Jill on Money with Jill Schlesinger. I can feel the dawn. I can You're back with Jill on Money. This is the program that takes the mystery out of your financial life. I'm Jill Schlesinger. And we'd love to hear from you. You got an opinion about something going on in the economy, tax reform, tax plan, tax cuts. Who knows? It's going to be a long time before we figure out what the ultimate plan really is. So don't get too excited. If you do have a financial question, give us a holler. A couple ways to get in touch with us. 855-411-JILL or email me. Ask Jill at jillonmoney.com. Uh, and don't forget, you can uh, go check out our website, jillonmoney.com. And there you'll find our podcast. You can find our YouTube channel. We've got all this stuff going on. Check it out, jillonmoney.com. Here's a question from Patricia. Both my mom and dad had trusts that have been divided in thirds for my sister, my brother, and me. I am the trustee. My brother will not take his share because he is filing for bankruptcy. So I have two trusts containing stocks, mutual funds, et cetera, and two checking accounts. Is there a way to consolidate these funds so that I don't have to manage them? That's so weird. Um, well, I guess it's weird because the money is in the trust. Wouldn't that trust, wouldn't that trust be part of the bankruptcy anyway? I don't know. I'm just thinking out loud. Uh, well, I don't think so. I think you're going to have to probably keep everything separate, unfortunately, Patricia. Um, what you may want to do is talk to an estate attorney who can actually give you some advice about this and then be able to kind of say, all right. Is there a way to streamline this? If so, great. If not, then you're going to have to keep doing it. It's a drag. I can't. I can't. It's very, it's to me one of those things where it's like a thankless job being the trustee. But at least they did something. So that's good. You know, sometimes I worry about these families where they're not doing anything. That's, that, that to me is the more critical issue that we face. And remember, people will always say to me, "Well, I don't need a, I don't need a, a, uh, a will. I don't, I don't really." Need, but you do. 
You probably do. There's very few people who don't need a will. Maybe you're just starting out. Maybe. Maybe you're uh, somebody who has just graduated from college. I'm trying to think of the, the possibility. You just graduated from college. You don't have anything going on in your financial life. Okay, maybe you don't need a will. But at some point, you are going to need a will. And uh, you shouldn't just do it online. You should go to a professional and do the will. Yeah, Mark, you need one. I mean, I guess, like, for you, Mark, think about this. If you were to drop dead, God forbid, what would I do without you? It'd be terrible. What happens? Well, the assets that are in your retirement account will pass by contract, right? They'll just go to whomever the beneficiaries are. Then the life insurance proceeds go to the named beneficiary in that policy. But, and how do you own the apartment? What's the, do you, how did you guys title it? Okay. And so you have a joint, so you have a titling, which is probably joint um, tenants with rights of survival. That's what it probably is. So then the girlfriend gets the apartment. But what about all the money in your account, like just your your plain old, let's just say your plain old investment account or your plain old checking savings account or your prized Bobby or photo? I don't know, whatever. But that's what that's really what you do. That that's what a will 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 actually say, like, this is what I want. To have. Maybe you actually want to be charitable. Maybe you say I want to make somebody the the beneficiary of this or maybe you want because if you were to die right now all of your I think what would happen based on New York law is that your assets would probably go to the kids to your nieces and nephews and yeah I think that that would be your direct line it may go to your sister it may be may go like some to your sister and some to her kids but maybe I think it might even go to your hey Mark it might go to your brother also yeah, so I'm just saying, one being the more responsible of the siblings, his sister. So you need a will. Brokerage accounts don't have beneficiaries because they. The one thing you could do is there's something called um, a a payable on death option, but you really should just you should have a will. You should have a will because you want to direct where your money is going. You want to have a voice in that. You want to be able to say, this is what I declare. You know, that's how, that's why you do it. So you're going to do it now? Don't you have a friend who's a lawyer? So just get a friend who's a lawyer and say, hook me up with an estate attorney. It'll cost five or six hundred bucks and get your, get it done. Why do you think it is high in your list? Right after what? Going to the gym? After you move in. Okay. You could do that now. It would be good. I'm just saying. Anyway, everyone, please do your estate planning. Do I have to beg you? Do I? Obviously, I do. <laughs> I, I know. It's just, it's so weird. I know that you don't want to think about death. I know you don't want to think about bad things happening. But it is actually better to contemplate this while you are aware and and able to do it and all those things okay so please just do it you're listening to jill on money 855-411-JILL send us an email ask jill at jillonmoney.com we'll be right back You're back with Jill on Money. This is the program that takes the mystery out of your financial life. Hey, uh, stay tuned. We have an unbelievable interview coming up in the second hour with Kathy O'Neill. She is the author of a book called Weapons of Math Destruction. She's going to talk about how these weirdo algorithms and different math formulas have actually led to inequality in the United States probably around the world, but she is talking mostly about the United States. So stick around. We've got that in the second hour.
Okay, let's do this question here. This is from Mark, not our Mark, a different Mark. A quick question on your column, what to do after a credit breach, which ran in the Chicago Tribune. I understand I'm entitled to one free report from each agency a year. Is that one report per calendar year or on a rolling 12 months basis? In other words, I just requested a report from one of the three agencies. Can I request another free report from that same agency in January 2018 or do I no- need to wait a full year until September 2018? I don't know the answer to that. I think it is a calendar year. What do you think, Mark? I think he's going to have to. Yeah, I think he's going to have to wait. Um, oh, you think he's going to have to wait a full year. That's interesting. I don't know. Uh, well, go to um, just let's go to annualcreditreport.com, which is different. Annualcreditreport.com, you are entitled to your free report once a year. That one, I think, is the calendar year one. Ah, so that's every 12 months. So it must be on a rolling 12 month basis. Let's assume it's the rolling 12 month basis. That's the best way to do it. That's what I'm going to. So you see, I didn't know that, but I learned something new. All right. So on a rolling 12 month basis, and I think it would be the same with everyone. Uh, Poor Mark was the victim of a minor episode of identity theft two years ago, and it was a major pain to clear it up. So he says, I want to closely monitor reports from all three agencies. Um, Okay, you know what, Mark? Freeze your credit at all three. That's what I would do. Freeze it. All right. Uh, You are listening to Jill on Money, 855-411-JILL. Ask Jill at JillOnMoney.com. Stay tuned. Kathy O'Neill, she's up next. We'll be right back. It's the weekend, which means it's time for Jill on Money, the show that makes money fun and just happens to answer all your financial questions. Here's your host, Jill Schlesinger. Welcome to Jill on Money. It's our number two. If you've got a financial question, we'd love for you to contact us. So easy to do. Give us a call. Easy. 855-411-JILL. See? Simple. How about an email? Our email address is askjill at jillonmoney.com. And today we have such an exciting, fabulous guest. And the reason is that she is, number one, the kind kind of guest we love, the kind of person who takes complicated and tough, thorny stuff, boils it down, and just is able to break through. Her name is Kathy O'Neill. She has a book that is called Weapons of Math Destruction, How Big Data Increases Inequality and Threatens Democracy. Uh, Kathy is, uh, by the way, is long listed for the National Book Award. It's a New York Times bestseller. It's just out in paperback. So we thought we would be happy to present an interview with the wonderful Kathy O'Neill. And uh, we start this with a very funny first question. So stay tuned. It's Jill on Money with my interview of Kathy O'Neill. What is the best financial decision or career decision or money decision that you've ever made in your life? Taking all my money out of the stock market. Really? When did you do that? I mean, not at the worst time, not at the worst time, but not at a great time, but it just freed me. I just don't think about it anymore. So you're not invested right now at no, all? No, not at all. It, why? It just freaked you out too much? It distracted me, to be honest. Wow. And the truth is, like, I I mean, maybe I'm bragging here, but like... Yeah, you I, should. My job is to think. And if I spend my time worrying about the market, I'm not making money thinking. And like, I actually make more money thinking than I would by investing. It's not like I have a lot of money, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> we'll, we'll do. We'll look at your balance sheet after. All right, I like that idea because I do like the idea that it can drive you crazy. It can drive you crazy. I'll tell you what. Like I've spent a lot of time with very poor people and with very rich people, and the people who worry the most about money are people at the extremes. 
The people who are in the middle who are like, I have enough money not to worry about it, but I don't have enough money to worry about it. There was like an interesting survey about money and happiness. And I think that there was like a sweet spot where they said sort of like 75000 to to $100,000 a year, is a year in income was like where they found the happiest people. Because, again, I've got my shelter. I've got this. I don't have so much money where I have to really start like freaking out because I'm not going to save a ton of money for my kids college. And I'm going to just plot along and do my job. And but, you know, that goes against my mother's theory, which is richer, poor, it's nice to have money. Dude, I, I'm probably going to regret this. I'm probably I'm probably going to be like, I'm such an idiot. The market is so high. I mean, you probably already feel that way. But instead, I just feel like I don't even have to worry about it. This is going to be great. So I was teasing myself as I was reading through this, so excited, folding pages down. And I'm reading it. And my girlfriend says to me, honey, you have every single page folded down. It really down. does almost look that way. It's a little scary. It's so extremely I, flattering. So it, it may be flattering, but it's not going to be helpful for this interview. <laughs> So you can't go through every single point. Kathy O'Neill, uh, New York Times bestseller, Weapons of Math Destruction, how big data increases inequality and threatens democracy. So, Kathy, you are a data scientist. You're a math nerd. Yeah, right? I am. Sure. Why would you write this book? Well, I wrote the book because after my experiences as a quant in finance, because I worked at a hedge fund with Larry Summers, like during the crisis. Um, I left finance sort of disgusted the way, with the way that mathematics was being used and abused. You remember the mortgage-backed securities and the AAA ratings? Well, those AAA ratings were a mathematical lie. Mm. And it really upset me that mathematics was be the sort of trust in mathematics was being abused. And so many people trusted those AAA ratings. They and internationally people invested in them. I um, mean, it really screwed up the economy because of an underlying mathematical lie. And I know that's not the whole story. There's a lot of corruption going on. A lot of people should have gone to jail. They didn't. But there was at its heart this sort of dishonesty. And it made me realize that mathematical algorithms, when they are being misrepresented can really have devastating consequences. Let's back up a second yeah. because, okay, I'm a little bit of a math nerd. Oh, awesome. So let's go back for the people who are absolutely freaked out by the word math yeah. right now who are yeah. listening. And let's talk about what is an algorithm sure. and how they can process that. And what's the difference between a good algorithm and a bad one? I'm glad we're doing that because like one of my most important points is like you don't need to be a math nerd to understand the kind of corruption and failure I'm talking about. So an algorithm for me is something we actually do in our heads on a daily basis. It's using sort of past information, past data to predict something. So for example, um, I like to use the following um, example. Look, I make dinner for my family. I have three sons and a husband. And I like to make a dinner that would be successful, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so what is the information I have? Well, how did past dinners go? What did people eat? What did people not eat? How well cooked should this be if I want to get people to eat it, et cetera, like that. So the, the data coming in is all the past dinners, but also the actual ingredients I have in my kitchen. And I should say that I don't include all the ingredients. And this is already part of how I'm embedding my agenda mm -hmm. into that model. So I don't include Robin noodles. That my my seventeen year old <laughs> loves ramen noodles, but I'm like that's not really food to me, right? <laughs> I don't consider Jello for the most dinners, right? I'm not saying there will be no dinner where I'd have Jello, but on an average night, I'm like, no, that's not part of food mm -hmm. dinner. So I curate my data, and this is one of the most important things that people always curate the data. They decide what's relevant, mm -hmm. and that's a very subjective choice. And then I make the dinner, blah blah blah. I sit down with my family, we eat. Then afterwards, I look at the dinner and I say, was this successful or not? You get the feedback, probably right. in real time. Yes, except the very important point is that I'm in charge, so I get to decide what success looks like. Ah. Uh. So I define success to be my kids ate enough and they ate their vegetables. Okay. Okay. Was that your act kind of mother? Because I'm that kind of bitchy mother. <laughs> yeah. Um, I just the point being that if my eight year old were in charge, the definition of success would be: Did I get to eat Nutella? Uh. <laughs> <laughs> because that's all he cares about, literally. So. The point I'm trying to make, though, is that the definition of success matters crucially because I will make the next meal depending on whether this meal was successful. Mm -hmm. I'll make the next meal like this meal in some way, right? And if I had chosen the Nutella definition of success, it would be a very different sequence of meals. Mm -hmm. But I'm in charge. And you get to make that determination. You get to filter what comes back at you in terms of the feedback. Exactly. Yep. I get to decide what's important, what's not, what a failure looks like, how much to penalize myself for a failure, et cetera. 
So going back to finance, the AAA-rated mortgage-backed security credit ratings, they decided what kind of data to use. They didn't have any of the relevant data, so they just used old data that looked good. It was the wrong thing to do, but their definition of success wasn't that AAA-rated mortgage-backed securities never defaulted. Their definition of success was they got more market share. They got paid. Right. We got paid by the client. They sold more of this stuff. It's highly unlikely that this whole series of events would be... I don't even know if they thought about the downside when they were doing it. I don't think they did. I think they literally were just so greedy Mm. and dishonest that they were like, oh, well, it's working as long as the machine keeps turning. We'll be back with our interview of Kathy O'Neill in just a moment. Remember, if you've got a financial question, we'd love to hear from you. Ask Jill at JillOnMoney.com. That's our email address. You can always send us a note there or follow us on Twitter at JillOnMoney. We'll be right back. It doesn't matter if you're 25 or 65, Jill Schlesinger is here to help you. Back to Jill on Money. You're back with Jill on Money, and we are very fortunate to have a special guest here. It's so great to have Kathy O'Neill. Her book is called Weapons of Math Destruction. And uh, again, I cannot emphasize enough how important it is that we understand the types of things that are being used about us and the way that math, you think it's just science, it's fact, it's an equation, but there are a lot of variables and there's human beings that are involved with picking which variables will be used for any formula or algorithm. That's why it's really important to try to get down to the bottom of this, also to understand how the most recent crisis, which is almost 10 years old, how that actually occurred. Our guest, Kathy O'Neill, weighs in. The thing that freaked me out about that period of time as someone who kind of digs statistics and like old time options traders, that I would talk to people on Wall Street. So, you know, I was still managing money then and I would talk to some people I knew that were like institutional people and I would say things like, but I don't understand and fill in the blank. It would just be a normal question. Like, well, what happens if, well, that's not going to happen. It's never happened before. But but a lot of things that have never happened before happen. So have you modeled that? And they would, I think maybe they were more of the salespeople or the trader types who would say, but the guys in the the quants tell us everything's fine. So they relied on math to make themselves feel better. Mm -hmm. But did they ever ask those questions or was it, were they so blinded by the money? I think it's a little of both, but I'll say as one of those quants, because that's what I did, like I asked stupid questions too, and the other quants were like, don't ask stupid questions. Oh, really? But you're absolutely right, and I think that's a very important point, which is that a lot of this belief system, which it really was a belief system, was propped up by the underlying authority of mathematics. Mm -hmm. And that's what I left finance thinking, that's that's nasty. Like I'm a I'm a believer in mathematics. Mathematics is powerful and beautiful and true. This isn't mathematics. This is something else. This is marketing or something along those lines. And it is actually obscuring truth rather than clarifying. Tell me a, an example of a good algorithm that's like, oh my God, that works. Be- that's, tell me the beauty of math. Get people psyched about an <laughs> algorithm that works that you think is like, oh man, that's awesome. I think my favorite use of math and prediction is probably from sports. I mean, I just think it's really cool to come up with different ways of measuring sports um, players and like how how are they valuable to the team? How do they how do they contribute to a win? Because it's important to know that there's very specialized sports is very specialized in a few ways. First of all, it's very clear what you're going for, and that's winning. Remember, we were talking about like the definition of success for cooking Right. in this realm it's pretty clear what you're going for you want your team to win and maybe maybe you're it's actually you should think you wanted to win the world series if you're in baseball instead of winning a specific game but it's pretty much the same thing on Mm -hmm. a daily basis the second thing that's really special about sports besides that it's really fun and entertaining is that you get feedback and this is something after i left finance i went to data science i saw a really a problematic 
um, series of algorithms that don't get this critical feedback. In other words, in sports, if you have underestimated the potential of a player and you don't pick him up on your team and it goes to another team, then you'll see you made a mistake. Right, because that feedback is continuing whether or not that person's with you or not. And in baseball, you have 162 games, so it's even better than football, which is 16 games. Right, right. Baseball is obviously my favorite sport. So a good algorithm, a good use of algorithm, sports. Yes. Now let's talk about— Here's another one. Yeah. Amazon. Amazon does an amazing, amazing job. And again, it's about a feedback loop, right? Huge numbers, right? And you get that information constantly. Constantly, and they say, oh, you're the type of person who might like— baby rattles you know and they'll show me they'll show me a product and i'm like i don't want that and they'll show not just to me but to people like me and it doesn't work and guess what the machine does it says that didn't work let's not do that anymore and so instead they show me stuff that i actually want and by the way i'm not saying like amazon's my favorite company because i'm actually really scared of amazon taking over the world and having an enormous amount of power but i do want to say they do big data really well what about netflix Netflix I like. That's pretty interesting, right? It's interesting. I love the technical details of recommendation engines. It's really fun. I mean, it's not perfect because think about it. Like some populations watch way more um, movies and they rate more movies. And that information means because they are over- represented, that means like but recommendation engine is going to work a lot better for them than for me. And when I say them, I'm talking about my teenage sons. Of course. So the recommendation engine is tilted towards people who use it more. But that kind of makes sense. Yeah, I guess. But it means that they know me less. And by the way, I don't hate algorithms. I worry about algorithms that are potentially very harmful. And the thing you can say about Netflix is the worst harm that can come to you is that you watch a movie you don't like. It's just not that big a deal. Right. So let's talk about the scary ones. And you start the book um, with a few of them. So I, I love this part where you say there will always be mistakes because models are, by their very nature, simplifications. No model can include all of the real world's complexity or the nuance of human communication. To create a model, then, we make choices about what's important enough to include, simplifying the world into a toy version that can be easily understood and from which we can infer important facts and actions. Now, what struck me about that is when you're trying to model something with variables that aren't exactly measurable, right? The qualitative, not the quantitative. That seems to me where you run into some of the biggest problems. So can you talk a little bit about the teacher evaluations, which is the one that just jumps out and is horrifying to me? It is horrifying. And by the way, it's still being used. Yeah, I know. So the idea is hold teachers accountable. Well, if you're going to hold teachers accountable, if you're going to get rid of bad teachers, you're going to have to define which teachers are bad. So if you think about it, like what makes a teacher a good teacher? And the answer that they came up with was, let's just look at test scores. Mm. Now, you and I both know that a good teacher isn't defined by their test scores. It's defined by whether they inspire or whether they include everyone or or making sure they don't shame anyone. There's all sorts of ways you could be a good or a bad teacher. Mm. Test scores is the only information they really take in about a given teacher. Is that because it's the only quantitative data that you can grab? Is that why they... It's the easiest. It's the easiest. I think it's just literally like let's close our eyes and hope this works type Mm, of stuff. mm. Um, And it doesn't work because what they've come up with is almost a random number generator for each student in a person's class. So if you have 30 students, you have 30 kids, each of them comes in at the beginning of your fourth grade year with an expected end of year score on their standardized tests. It's based partly on their end of third year, third grade score. Also, which class they're in, which teacher they have, which school they're in, which school system they're in, how many kids are in the class, how many kids qualify for a free school lunch, which is a proxy for poverty. Mm -hmm. Complicated formula, but essentially what they're expected to get at the end of the year. And it's not a very good model. It's not very accurate. Imagine you trying to figure out, just knowing what a kid got at the end of the school year and looking around the school, like trying to figure out what they're going to get at the end of next year. In a year. That's hard to predict. Mm -hmm. and. And indeed, it's pretty uncertain. And then they compare for your 30 students. They all come up with an expected score. They they compare it with the actual scores your kids get. So if somebody was expected to get a 50, but they got a 60, you would give, give credit for that. So you get credit or you're penalized for the difference between their actual and expected scores. So if you raised everyone's score 10 points above expected, then you would obviously be a magnificent teacher. That's typically not what happens. But also very importantly... The idea is that 
only you, you and only you are responsible for the difference between these two numbers. But actually, these two numbers are extremely uncertain. You would think your actual score of, a, of an actual kid would be just a number. But think about it. If you took it on a different day, or if you got less sleep that day, or if it was a hot day and you didn't have air conditioning, or you did have air conditioning, lots of different variables, or you had it after lunch and you didn't eat lunch, you know, lots of variables could just change the actual score a kid gets in a given test. Mm -hmm. Or the test itself could be harder that year than expected, mm -hmm. which happens all the time. Hmm. So you have two numbers, you're taking the difference, they're both uncertain, the difference is actually more uncertain. And the end result is that teachers are being scored on sort of the average of 30 very random numbers. And that means that the teacher scores themselves are almost random. We'll get back to our interview with Kathy O'Neill in just a second. Hey, during the break, go buy her book, Weapons of Mass Destruction. It's available in paperback. And you can also go to our website, jillonmoney.com. Check out our blog posts, check out TV segments, everything. Anything that Mark feels like putting up. 855-411-JILL is our phone number. Ask Jill at jillonmoney.com. That's our email address. We'll be right back. From rookie investors to savvy veterans, Jill Schlesinger is here to help you. Call now, 855-411-JILL, or email askjill at jillonmoney.com. That's life. That's love. That's what all the people You're say. You're back with Jill on Money. If you've got a financial question, we'd love to hear from you. 855-411-JILL. Send us an email, askjill at jillonmoney.com. And we are so lucky because we are talking with Kathy O'Neill. She is the author of the fantastic book, Weapons of Math Destruction. So easy to read. It's so it's amazing to to read someone who can break down complicated things like algorithms in a way that we can all understand. So check it out, out in paperback. Uh, you know, you may think about algorithms as something that's used to create uh, financial products or to quantify risk. But you know what? They're also used in our nation's school systems. That's what Kathy tells us. There is a story in the book that you tell of one New York City school teacher where one year, I think it was like a six and the other was 90 or something. 96. What? Yes. I know. And he didn't change the way he taught. I mean, his conclusion, which was appropriate, was this system doesn't make any sense. Oh, my God. He was allowed to make that because he did. He already had tenure, and this wasn't about getting fired. Whereas Sarah Wasaki, who I profiled at the beginning of the book, did get fired. She got fired based on her overall teacher assessment, 50% of which was her value-added model score. This is what I've been describing, the mm -hmm. value-added model, which was extremely bad. And she thought about it, and she said, you know, a lot of the kids that, that were in my fourth grade class had gotten really high scores at the end of third grade, but came in and didn't know how to read or write. Okay. That's very strange, right? Mm -hmm. And it was under Michelle Rhee, a superintendent in Washington, D.C. The now disgraced. Yes, I would say. She not only fired people like Sarah for getting a bad score, she also gave bonuses for really good scores. So people fudge their numbers. I mean, there are certainly incentives. Mm -hmm. And the school that those kids came from, they had an unusual number of erasures, but nobody really investigated. So we had, at least Sarah had plenty of evidence to suspect that her score was being artificially deflated by previous cheating. Hmm. Because think about it. If teachers had cheated on those tests, they came in with inflated expected scores and Sarah couldn't possibly make up the difference. Mm -hmm. Right. She tried to appeal her score, but she was told that the process was fair based on it being a mathematical algorithm. But they didn't open that up. It wasn't a transparent model. It wasn't at all transparent. And that's I'm going to just just come to the definition for me of mm -hmm. a weapon of math destruction, mm -hmm. which is a powerful, highly scaled secret and destructive algorithm. Mm. And that's what this value-added model became, right? It was powerful. It was being used to fire people in an entire school system. And it's actually being used, it was at the time at least, being used in more than half of the states, usually in urban school districts. It is secret. Nobody understands it, including, by the way, most of the people in the school systems themselves. They were being made in these little, little tiny, like think tanky places and sold to the school systems um, with a like a license saying saying like you'll never see this formula. So even the superintendent of schools couldn't understand the formula. And if you think that, you know, weapons of mass destruction are not pertinent to your life, not it's not just your shopping and it's not just your teaching, 
But we're also talking about, and in the book you go into this, policing and incarceration. So Mm -hmm. talk about that because that to me is where like, oh my God, the real life, I mean, it's terrible this woman lost her job. The next bad iteration of this really feels pretty awful to me. This is a huge, huge thing. And most, mostly, if you read about it in the media, you'll see it touted as like scientific policing. Right. Right. Like and, targeted. Yes. And this, again, for me, is like an abuse of the authority of mathematics. Like we should trust math. We shouldn't trust mathematical algorithms because, again, you curate the data and you, you define success. Um, so the first sort of realm of algorithms being used in the justice system are predictive policing algorithms. And they basically say, look at the sort of location of previous arrests. um, And then they say, let's predict the next crime based on the location of previous arrests. The difference between where crimes happen and where arrests happen is very, very large. Mm -hmm. It's most people don't really think about this, but most crimes don't lead to arrests, especially drug crimes. Right. But in some places, they really do, much more often anyway. So what, what's happened is, because of the data, the arrests are happening where we've been doing broken windows policing, where we've been sort of putting lots and lots of police in, um, in poor minority neighborhoods. And we are finding those low level, level crimes because that was the point of broken windows policing under Bloomberg and stop and frisk. That was the point of it. So the data will tell us, go back there. That's where the crimes are occurring. The thought experiment I like to do around this, which I think you'll enjoy, is what if after the crisis, cops were sent down to Wall Street to arrest all the bankers? And because, you know, there is where the crime is. Mm-hmm. If they had done that, then the data we have would be very different. It would say, oh, go back to Wall Street. That's where the crime is. That's Let's go look for crime over there. Um, it's not what we ch- just chose to do as a, as a society. Um, but that sort of brings up the, the real point, which is that we are just as much predicting our society as we are predicting crime. I mean, I kind of liked it more when we were talking about baseball, I got to tell <laughs> you. This is, uh, this is definitely sobering. Is there a way to build a better algorithm to do what they're trying to do? Could you could you create such a algorithm for either teachers or policing that you think is a fairer way to try to do what they're trying to do? So with teachers, I don't know how to do it, but I will tell you what I would how I would test anything. If I were asked to build something, I wouldn't accept what I've built until it agrees closely with a qualitative assessment of teachers that we can agree on. So the whole sort of the genesis of the the fast teacher ability assessments was that, yes, we, we could assess teachers qualitatively, but it's very expensive mm-hmm. and it doesn't scale. Well, my argument would be we have to make sure that whatever we come up with agrees with that qualitative assessment before we try scaling it. As far as the policing thing goes, it's really tricky because what big data models do is they propagate the past. They repeat patterns because that's what algorithms are good at. They're picking up historical patterns and repeating them. And the question we have to ask ourselves is, do we want to repeat our past policing patterns or do we want to really change the way we do policing? My feeling personally is we would probably want to rethink it. And if we rethink it, then the data we get out of it will look very different. Mm. Now, if we really changed policing and we kept it different, then an algorithm built on that kind of data would look different. And maybe that would be a good way to go. But I think right now the data is so painfully biased against poor minority neighborhoods that I don't know how to fix that. We'll get back to our interview with Kathy O'Neill in just a minute. If you would like to talk to us, give us a holler, 855-411-JILL. Send us an email, ask Jill at jillonmoney.com. We'll be right back. Back to Jill on Money with Jill Schlesinger. Want to get in touch? Call or email any day, anytime. 855-411-JILL or ask Jill at JillOnMoney.com. You're back with Jill on Money. And today we've got a special guest, Kathy O'Neill. Her book, Weapons of Math Destruction. It's fantastic. It's out in paperback. 
And as you might imagine, with all the information about Equifax and credit and credit scores and credit reports in the news, we cover that ground. Here's my interview with Kathy O'Neill. Also in the book, you talk about using algorithms and how they're incorporated with things that we encounter every day in the financial world, like your credit score, yep. as well as uh, maybe insurance Absolutely. sales. So let me just start with the, the credit score, because people really do get wrapped around the axle about their credit scores. And I think that, you know, when I first entered the financial planning business, no one talked about a credit score. Like when you got a mortgage, someone talked a tiny bit about credit, but mostly you're walking into your banker and saying, yeah. here's how much money I made. Here's my tax returns. What do I get? Yeah. So talk about the evolution of how algorithms have changed the credit system right now. Great. I mean, and this is such a sobering story, actually. So it was actually part of the women's lib movement that they, they would notice, especially divorced women, had a lot of trouble getting any credit whatsoever from their, their local banker. Because as you say, the bankers would look you up and down, ask you for papers. If all you could provide was stuff that happened when you were married, like bankers just didn't give it credit to women for that. And that was a, a problem. And this is sort of around the same time as the civil rights movement. So lawmakers actually, policymakers actually responded to this and said, you know what? It should not be legal to base creditworthiness on a gender. And then at the end, they put in race either. It really upended the loan business for small bankers. And they were like, what? How are we going to figure out who's creditworthy? In response to this, FICO, the FICO score was born. People think of this as like an awful thing, but actually FICO scores, they were created in response to this law as a way of sort of letting banks continue with the process of loans, saying like, these are by construction legal. They do not use race. They do not use gender. And you can use them to decide who to give a loan to. And of course, bankers loved it because it was much easier for them. And it allowed them to scale their loans actually much, much higher. And that's one of the reasons we've seen so many more credit cards because FICO scores made it so much easier for everyone to think about loaning to each other. It was very sanitary. It was like mm -hmm. sanitize the whole process. By the way, so it made me feel a little bit better reading the book about Fair Isaac as like just as an organization, even though I think that credit scores are just overblown in terms of like what they've come to mean. But Absolutely. I would argue that the credit scores as a way of deciding who's credit worthy are actually pretty good because they're based on, let's recall, they're based on like your actual ability to pay your electricity bill. Your history. Your history of paying your bills, which right. I think everyone would agree with is a fair yeah. measure. What's wrong with it is that they're being used to decide whether you can perform at a job. Right. Get an apartment Get even. Get an apartment or even have a date. And the reason, of course, that's so bad is because if you've lost your job and then you've been unemployed for a while, your credit score is inevitably beginning to go down. So it, it makes it harder to get that job. You're starting to see a pattern. The people who are unlucky become more unlucky. The people who are lucky get luckier. I'm not trying to say that I should be in charge of ethics. I'm just, I'm very progressive. I'm not representative, right? I'm saying we need to have an ethical conversation separate from an algorithm. And we can't just say this algorithm is inherently fair and objective. It's simply not. It is subjective. And we need to understand the subjectivity. Tell me about insurance, because we, by the way, get a gazillion questions about insurance on the program here. I think the easiest case to make that insurance and big data is really essentially incompatible is health insurance. We have no idea what's going on with health insurance in this country, so let me scare you. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Everyone prepare to hang on. <laughs> so the underlying concept of insurance is pretty simple. We're a village. Let's just say we have a 1,000-person village, right? When people get sick, they go to the doctor, and they spend their entire life savings getting well. And they're broke afterwards, so their life is ruined. And it's an awful tragedy for those people. Um, and we keep seeing this happen. And, and eventually someone comes up with a smart idea. They say, let's pool our resources. Let's all, like once a month, put in a, an affordable amount of money into this big urn. And someone is going to get paid a little bit to protect the urn, right? And then when somebody gets sick, they can take money out of the urn to pay for their insurance. Okay. They pay for their doctors. Mm -hmm. And they won't end up like a defeated, broken person. Right. Okay. That is insurance. It's pooled risk. Right. The idea being put in an affordable amount amount of money every month instead of having an unaffordable amount of money expected you of at a specific terrible time. Right. Now introduce big data. What does big data do? Big data allows us to profile and segregate and silo every single person based on their risk. Mm -hmm. So somebody who's pretty sick or about to be sick is going to be 
charged way more than somebody who seems like they're not sick at all and they're not going to get sick. Mm -hmm. Now, obviously, there's all sorts of things that are totally unpredictable, like breaking your leg. And by the way, I should say that like those algorithms, those AI, really, that's learning about our future health risks could be invaluable tools for our doctors. Mm. If our doctors see what we're, we're at risk of and help us prevent those illnesses. Mm -hmm. But in the hands of insurance companies, what do they do? They just silo you off, say you're in a high risk pool, you're in a low risk pool. Oh, good news, low risk people. And they always frame it as good news. Yeah. Always. Great good news. news your, your premiums have just gone down. In the world of market competition among insurance companies, it's simple. What they're trying to do is get rid of all the sick people and lower the premiums as much as possible on the healthy people, which mm. is to say get only only really, really healthy people. And the asymptotic limit of this, as a nerd, I have to say that every I now and then. I love that word. Is insurance for people who don't need it and no insurance for people who need it. Mm. We have defeated the purpose of pooled risk if we get rid of everybody who's risky. Thanks again to Kathy O'Neill. What a wonderful interview. Go out and buy her book, Weapons of Mass Destruction. It's available in paperback. If you've got a financial question, 855-411-JILL. Send an email. Ask Jill at jillonmoney.com. We'll be right back. You're back with Jill on Money. If you've got a financial question, just give us a holler. It's so easy to get in touch with us. 855-411-JILL. That's our phone number. Our email address, askjill at jillonmoney.com. Follow us on Twitter at Jill on Money. Mark, we hit 14,000. Did you notice? Finally. Finally. You want 15,000 by the end of the year? That seems reasonable. I think that's okay. I like that. Uh, okay. Uh, if you've missed any part of the show or you didn't quite catch all of the Kathy O'Neill interview, don't forget that uh, you can go to our YouTube channel. Actually, forget that. Just go to JillOnMoney.com. Mark put a beautiful link right up on top to the YouTube channel. And you can listen to the uh, earlier part of the interview and past interviews and past shows. It's all great. So just do that. Go to JillOnMoney.com. And you will see all the information you need. Uh, okay. A couple weeks ago, we uh, had a question from a caller. And uh, we got a response to that. The subject of this email that we received from B in Springfield, Missouri. And the subject was $2.2 million. A few days ago, I heard your radio broadcast about the gentleman who had his Social Security two military pensions and didn't know what to do with all that. He also had the $2.2 million. B says, I've had a checking account since I was eight years old, worked till now, age 59. And I never thought I would feel such sadness for a fellow with that sort of a problem. Dripping with sarcasm. I love this so much. It's funny. There are so many kids who would benefit from technical training. How about scholarships to micro we works to something like that? Anyway, how about scholarships to do that? Give them a hug from me. <laughs> I know. We felt the same way. But, you know, look, it, I what can I say? That's that's one of those weird calls where, you know, the guys just he was so stressed out about taxes. We had a few questions over the last month or so where people were so upset about taxes. And I'm like, oh, my God, but you have all this money anyway. Uh, it was a great show. Thank you all for listening. Uh, don't forget to go buy Kathy O'Neill's book, Weapons of Math Destruction. Our phone number here is 855-411-JILL. Send us an email, ask Jill at jillonmoney.com and say hi to Mark and tell him we need some new music. All right, we'll see you next week. Thanks for listening.